challenges. What do I see as as challenges in the transatlantic relationship, transatlantic aerospace. Well, let's say, I need to be very careful here because I'm not a, not a politician, but I think everybody, every interested citizen can pick that up, that right now we have in the US, as well as in Europe, two largely dysfunctional political systems. Um, well, in the US, as you all know, sequestration is carrying on. And for me, at least, very amazingly, people seem to get used to it. Sequestration becomes a fact of life. <laughs> Recently, there is new concern and excitement about uh, a possible default of the US government, the shutdown of the US government, uh, reaching yet again another threshold of national uh, debt. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's strange to see, I should say, for, for Europeans still, even though we see that fear to playing now for a couple of years, that the US, where once it seemed that, uh, you know, the big parties were able to cooperate much better across the, the party lines than in Europe. There was more ideology in party politics that uh, this seems to have to uh, maybe even reversed. So, Another round of chicken game probably in the U.S. ahead of us. But ladies and gentlemen, I think the situation in Europe is much worse. Um, and I say this because I do not see, and I'm certainly not the only one, a orientation of where Europe, I'm talking about the European Union, uh, should go, where it's headed. We have a lack of clear leadership. There are concepts for further integration, concepts for further deepening of the European Union, particularly in the Eurozone. There are concepts for repatriation of competences, whether today at EU level to national uh, uh, authorities. But there's no clear picture emerging of where Europe uh, is going. I have to say, I have. Uh, quite some sympathy for the approach that David Cameron was introducing earlier this year. Not for <coughs> all the elements, but certainly to reflect on, to pause and to reflect on what should really be done at European level and what is better done following the good old subsidiarity principle at national and today I would say increasingly at, at regional level. But there are certain things that absolutely should be done at European level and this is about common European uh, economic policy and fiscal policy. And certainly, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, foreign insecurity policy. The second challenge I see is, this is uh, somewhat in, uh, aligned or uh, attached to the first point, when we need to bring our respective economic houses in order on both sides of the Atlantic. In simple terms, we cannot continue to live beyond our means, spend much more than we generate in wealth and tax revenues, consume more than we invest, and leave to the following generations economies that are in shambles. The level of debt on both sides of the Atlantic, I think, is, is frightening. Um, and there's further debt accumulating as we speak. Another challenge is certainly in the Middle East, the potential for further frustration, for further misalignment and conflict. We look at Syria just recently, but uh, Iran and certainly the Palestinian conflict is not uh, going away. The uh, same counts, I think, for relationship with Russia and China. Uh, put it bluntly or shortly, cooperation or containment, or to what degree cooperation and to what degree containment, certainly another potential source for misalignment between the partners on both sides of the, of the Atlantic. And last but not least, the, um, I call that the collective security arrangements between the US and Europe. By the way, when have you last heard about NATO. Who is able to 
to uh, say what the name of the current Supreme Allied Commander in Europe is. I was wondering about that this morning in the plane, and I have to admit, I don't. Um, there's a growing capability gap between Europe and America, the US, in terms of military forces. Uh, there's a slogan being kicked around, uh, smart defense. I think that just camouflages this growing capability gap and that the Europeans spend less and less for defense in comparison to the Americans. I don't know the exact number, but the American defense spending in terms of GDP, I think, is still about 4%. The European EUI is way below 2%. France and the UK and Greece, notably, who spend more than 2% of their GDP uh, on uh, defense. The question here for me really is, is there a chance for a common uh, European foreign and security policy? And as somebody who has observed that, seen more than 20 years ago, 20 years ago, still in the Ministry of Defense, and then in industry, as I said, as an interested amateur in reading uh, scores of declarations uh, of all these summits, I would, I would think that we are further away from a common European foreign security policy than ever, than at any point in the last uh, 20 years. I know it's maybe a bold thesis, but I really believe it.